here. I apologize again. And we'll get this fixed, all right? And once again, if you're a little warm back here, come up here and sit in the front. This thing is kicking cold air over here, all right? Don't go to sleep on me, amen? I've been gone two weeks. Don't go to sleep on me, all right? Praise God. If you could go to the next slide, I want you to see this picture closer to heaven, a joyous reunion. We are one day closer to going home. This is going to be a slide you're going to see quite often in this church because the Lord has given us another week. Starts today, another month will start tomorrow. Every single day that we are given, we are one day closer to going home. Amen. And I mean we're going home soon. Come on. Amen. There's no doubt in my mind. Yes, give the Lord a praise offering. He's coming again very soon. Praise God. How many are hungry for the word of God this morning? Amen. Now, before we get into today's message, I have a very important question that I want to ask every one of you who are here and those of you who are watching. Why are you here this morning? Think about it. Why did you get up early, get yourself dressed up, and come and sit in this sanctuary when you could have very easily stayed at home, gone to the beach, gone out and done something else? Why did you come here this morning? Amen. Now, if you're, you're, you're like so many who, who are in church this morning and say, well, it's Sunday. It's Sunday. I go to church on Sunday. You might as well stay at home. You might as well went to the beach. Come on. If that's your answer, it's Sunday because it's Sunday I'm going to church. My friend, you're wasting your time. But if you say in your heart, I have come to learn the truth of God's word. I have come because I want to know God's word and I want the Lord to transform me. That, my friend, is the reason why you should be here. Amen. Amen. I want to follow Jesus more and more. If you would, would you stand for the reading of God's word? Once again, we're going to look at a passage of scripture we looked at two weeks ago. I got part of the way through this message and then, of course, I went home and contracted COVID and had to stay home for a few weeks. So I'm going to pick it back up, but we're going to go quite quickly so we can get through this whole message today. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. The apostle Paul writes, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. There, my friend, is the problem. How many know that? When things are done through selfish ambition or conceit, my friend, there is where the church is failing the Lord. This is why we have division and strife in church. This is why churches are a mess today because there's too many selfish people in the church. Come on. In fact, one selfish person is one selfish person too many in the church. Amen. But instead, Paul writes, but in lowliness of mind, look what he says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. There, my friend, is the answer. There is the answer. Can I have an amen? Amen. There is the answer. Verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Brother and sister, hear me. This is not an option. This is not something you could take or leave. This is mandatory. All who claim to be Christians are going to become humble servants of Christ. Because the Holy Spirit's going to work in that person. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that your word not only is true, but it's powerful. And so today we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and lead and guide and teach us. Help us to understand where we're at with you. Let us examine our hearts this morning to see if we truly are becoming more and more like you, Lord, or if we're just playing church. Help us to realize, Lord, that you did not save us just to sit in these chairs on Sunday and go home and do nothing with our lives the rest of the week. But you saved us for a purpose, and that purpose is that we are to be making disciples for your glory. Now, Lord, help us today to understand that we can't accomplish anything if we don't humble ourselves. We cannot accomplish anything unless you're working in us. Therefore, let us completely decrease so you can increase in us. Now, put your hand on your heart and repeat this prayer. Say, Dear Jesus, Speak to my heart this morning. Open my eyes to see and open my ears to hear. And dear Jesus, change my heart today. 
Amen. You may be seated. It's good to have some guests with us this morning. God bless you for being here. Amen. Are we ready this morning? All right. Amen. We had a great Bible study this morning. Brother Ken, a tremendous Bible study. I love it when people are asking questions and commenting and learning because that's what the early church did. And that's the kind of church we are. We're the kind of church that we want you to learn. We're not, I don't want to just lecture you for an hour and, and, and then just hope you get it. I want you to learn. Amen. This morning's message is Developing the Mindset of a Humble Servant for Jesus. The subtitle is Bond Servant, Free to Be a Slave. How many get it today that you have been set free to be a slave? Come on. This is the goal. Of, this is what God wants to accomplish in your life and mine. This is our mission here at Abundant Life Fellowship to make disciples for Jesus Christ as a remnant end times church. And how many know our time is very limited? We don't have much time left. But what little time God gives us, we must be about our Heavenly Father's business. And therefore, this is why we look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. I want you to take a look at that slide up there. Now, those of you who have been a been attending Abundant Life Fellowship for any length of time, ought to know this verse by now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Amen. Amen. I mean, you ought to know it forward and backwards and inside out and upside down and every which way. Come on. Amen. Because it has been quoted, it has been read in this church for years every Sunday morning. Yet it is a vital passage of Scripture. All Scripture. Everybody say all Scripture. That means from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, 21. Come on. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That simply means God breathed into the writers of the books, the 66 books of the canon of scripture we have, what he wants us to know. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. All right. And it is profitable. It is beneficial to you and I for first, first thing. What is it? Doctrine. Everybody say doctrine. Doctrine simply means sound teaching, sound word of God, sound doctrine. It always starts with doctrine. You see, you cannot possibly be transformed by the Holy Spirit unless you get the truth of God's word in you. Someone shout amen. Amen. Doctrine comes first, truth. Then comes reproving, the rebuking part or the reproving part. Why? Because we're all sinners. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. And how many are glad God loves us enough to convict us? And the Holy Spirit reproves us through a convicting process. But he doesn't leave us just convicted. He also corrects us. Amen. For correction. That's the straightening out part. He convicts us of our sins. We repent of our sins. And he says, now, this is what I want you to do. That's the straightening out. Amen. And there is where really, if you want to get technical, there was, is where the transformation process really begins to take effect. When you're in the correction process. Amen. Because you're being straightened out. How many glad you're being straightened out? Thank God I've been being straightened out. <laughs> you wouldn't want to known me 50 years ago. Come on. You know, I was not a good person. But I want you to know something. The Lord is straightening us out. Amen. And he's not done with us until we go home to be with him. Amen. Then comes the instruction in righteousness. That means the Holy Spirit is instilling not only the truth of God's word in us, but he is producing the Holy Spirit fruit. Someone shout amen. The Holy Spirit fruit. Why? Look at the next part. So that the man of God may be what? Read this with me. That the man of God may be what? Oh, come on. I want to hear it. Everybody read it. That the man of God may be complete. Are you? Are you becoming more complete? Thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, there is God's purpose for you and me that we become equipped for every good work. Amen. Amen. The question, my friend, is are you? Are you? Do you represent Jesus? Or are you playing church? Sadly, many are just playing church every Sunday. They go to church, they sit in those pews, nothing happens from Sunday to Sunday. And that's something, my friend, I cannot understand. After all Christ did for you, he drank in God's wrath on that cross, to suffer for you so that you can have eternal life and all you're going to do is treat him like he's an hour and a half visit every Sunday. Hey, I'll visit you, Lord, but don't ask any more of me. I'll visit you on Sunday, but don't ask him any more of me. I'm going to do what I want. Friend, that is not true biblical Christianity. True biblical Christianity is when we are becoming true humble servants for Christ. Someone shout amen. amen. So I want to look at this vital truth. 
We looked at it two Sundays ago. As you become complete in Christ, remember, you cannot be complete unless you're truly saved. Amen. The Holy Spirit's doing the work. As you become complete in Christ, you're becoming like Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, become like Jesus. Now, if you are becoming like Christ, then that this means that you're going to develop a mindset of a truly humble servant. As we read earlier, humble servant, not a servant, a humble servant. If not, you do not know him. Someone give me an amen. amen. Please understand this, brother and sister. I have told you this many times. There are too many false converts in the church. We talked about it this morning. People that go to church for years are no more saved than an atheist. They believe in Jesus. They may even believe that he died on the cross for them. But there is not a transformation process going on in their lives. Why? Why is that? Because they never come to that point of allowing the Holy Spirit to convict them and to correct them and to instruct them in righteousness. Therefore, they just go to church Sunday after Sunday thinking, I'm fine, I'm a member of the church, I got baptized. You're not fine. You're not fine. And Jesus made it very clear in John's Gospel, chapter 15. You need to read this. Don't turn there now, but read it later. What did he say? I am the vine, you are the branches. Every vine that in me, every vine that dwells in me is going to produce much fruit for the glory of God. He says in verse 6, John 15, 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he's like a branch broken off. He's withered and cast into the fire. What's that mean? He's talking about those who are lost eternally. But if you are saved, how many days I'm saved? Then you should be coming more and more like Jesus, producing the fruit of the Spirit. Because, brother and sister, I want you to know something. We are to become more like Christ day by day. Amen. Now, we're never going to get there in this life, right? But we're going to soon. Amen. And I'll tell you when, all right? Let me tell you when. 1 John 3, 2. Let's look at this. See, one day, this life's going to be over, and we're going to be completely like Jesus. Now we're becoming more like Him. We're becoming more complete. We're becoming equipped for His glory. But soon, as the Word of God says in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth yet not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, amen, someone shout amen. amen. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. When will this day be when we will be fully like him? The day the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the air. Amen. Are you with me today? Amen. Any day now, the rapture of the church, praise God. Any day. I know there are some, so I don't believe in the rapture. Well, that's too bad. Because the Bible clearly teaches it. Amen. Amen. Colossians 1.15, Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn from among the dead. Amen. He got his glorified body first. Amen. You and I are about to get ours very soon. Amen. And how many are going to be glad for that day? No more sickness. No more death. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more tears. No more saying goodbye. Forever with Jesus. And that's why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18, comfort one another with these words. These words, it's soon, very soon, amen. We're going to be with him. I want you to look at the next slide, the rapture and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why am I talking about this? Because, brother and sister, the marriage supper of the Lamb proves that there has to be a pre-tribulation rapture. Oh, I have debated the post-tribbers, and you know how many times, I, I, by the time I'm, I'm done with them, they're screaming mad at me. They're almost mad that I believe in the rapture. <laughs> Can you imagine that? They are. They're, 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 uh, there's, there's, I, 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 sometimes I doubt they're even saved, the way they act. Well, I don't believe in the rapture. Well, why don't you? It's taught right in the Bible. But if that doesn't help you, let me just share something with you. There cannot be a marriage supper of the Lamb if there's not a pre-tribulation rapture. Come on. Go to the next picture. I don't know what it's going to be like fully, but I want you to see that picture. It's going to be glorious. Amen. But I want you to see what the words of John, as he wrote in Revelation chapter 19, 6 and 7. And I heard, as it were, John writes, the voice of a great multitude. Now, this great multitude is in heaven. Amen. It is the heavenly host. 
It is the angelic choir singing. And as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. How many know God is omnipotent, all powerful, and he reigns forever and ever? Amen. Come on. Now, let us be glad, verse 7. Look what the Word of God says. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory for what the marriage of the Lamb has come. Who's the Lamb? Who's the Lamb? Yes. Now, in order to have a marriage, you've got to have a bride. Who's the bride? And His wife has made herself ready. Who's the wife? The church, the blood-bought saints. Amen. Praise God. Now, look at verse 8. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in what? Fine linen, clean and bright. It was, array, it was granted for every true believer to be arrayed in fine linen at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's our wedding garments, amen. Now look what it says next. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Oh, you got to get this down. The fine linen, the white and bright clean garments that are given to the saints is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, not just the righteousness of Christ because, because of Christ's righteousness that's been imputed to us, because of the Holy Spirit that's in us, we begin to perform righteous acts the moment we become saved. Amen. Do you see this? Amen, right? The righteous acts are the good works that are the fruit. Now get this. They are the fruit of being justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Someone shout amen. amen. Now there's no doubt in my mind that the fine linen that we are going to be given. First of all, you, let me just make sure you understand. You can't put wedding garments on a spirit. That means you're going to have to have your glorified bodies. Amen. So we got to be with Jesus in heaven. You see, this teaching that we just go up, meet him in there, and make a U-turn and come back like the post-tribbers, that's just absolutely ridiculous. It's a joke, okay? We have to be with Jesus in heaven to get our white garments. Someone shout amen. And it's got to be part of the judgment seat of Christ because the Word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that we shall all appear before Christ at the judgment seat. Amen. The Bema seat. That we will be judged according to our works, not our sin. Amen. I'm glad we've already been judged for our sin. Amen. When we judged ourselves as sinners and repented and accepted Christ, that's been taken care of at the cross. Amen. But we will be judged for our works. When we stand before him at the great Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ. Now look at the next verse, what it says. Verse 9, then he said to me, right, blessed are those. You see that? Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Notice it didn't say blessed are those who go through the tribulation period. Come on. I mean... I know there are some, that I, I had one guy say, I, don't, I still don't believe in the rapture. And I said, you can stick around and go through the tribulation if you want. Have at her. I'm going home. Amen. I'm going to a marriage supper of the Lamb. Someone shout amen. How many are going? Come on. And he said to me, these are the what sayings? The true sayings of God. Someone shout amen. The true sayings of God. Amen. Now get this. God's not a man that he should lie. So this is a very encouraging word to us that we are one day going to stand before Jesus and get our wedding garments, but they are the righteous acts that you and I perform. They're the fine linen, amen. And if you're only saved one day, the fact is, did you know, Christ gives you his righteousness, you're still going to get your wedding garment. If you've been saved 50, 60, 70 years, you should have quite a lot of rewards built up, amen. Amen. But the fact is, we are all going to stand before him and get our wedding garments. Now, here's the question. Look at this next one, would you? Are you called to the marriage supper of the Lamb? It's a very important question. Are you called? You've got to be called to be part of the great bride of Christ. Amen. To stand with the eternal groom, Jesus. Are your wedding garments being prepared for you right now that Jesus will literally give you on that day? Amen. As part of the bride of Christ. Well, friends, let me just remind you something. There is a wedding supper we're heading to, amen? But there is a supper that took place 2,000 years ago. And what we do with the words of Jesus at that supper, known as the Passover supper, the last supper, will play greatly into what we wear on that day when we stand before Jesus. Let's look at John chapter 13, verse 1. We looked at the future supper that we're heading to, Let's look at the supper where it all started. 
In John 13, 1, the Word of God says, if you can go back one, please. John 13, 1. The Word of God says, having loved his own who were in the world, that he loved them to the end. What that means is that Jesus was about to show the greatest extent of his love to his disciples. And what does he do? As we go to the next slide, you can see he, he's preparing the Passover supper. But what he do next? What he does next is it's so phenomenal. And it's something we, you and I need to get a hold of as we learn what it means to be a true humble servant for Christ. As we know, he washes his disciples' feet. Now, I talked about this the last two, two, two times when I was preaching that what Jesus did was a servant's job, a bond servant's job got up from the table and literally washed their stinky feet so that they could eat. In John 13, verse 15 and 16, Jesus said, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now, once again, he's not teaching foot washing. Okay? He's not teaching that at all. He's teaching being a servant, plain and simple. Amen. He's talking about being a humble servant. Someone shout amen. Amen. Now, Jesus is not just talking to the disciples who were there that night. He's talking to all of us. How many are a disciple of Jesus? Jesus is speaking to all of us who are disciples. Now, look at verse 16. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Verse 17. If you what? Know these things. Blessed are you if you believe them. I'm going to read that again. If you know these things, blessed are you if you what? Do them. In other words, obey my words. That's what Jesus is saying. Obey my words by doing what I have done for you. John 13, 15, I have given you example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Someone shout amen. Do you see that? Do you see that this morning? Now, from here on out, this is what we're going to talk about. How important is it that we as believers in Christ become a true, humble servant? Here's a vital truth. Now get this. A true convert will perform righteous acts for God's glory. Someone shout amen. Amen. Please understand this. We, We talked about true and false converts. A true convert is going to be transformed and is going to perform righteous acts for God's glory. Now get this. You and I just can't do that. No one can perform righteous acts unless he or she is being transformed by the word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit who makes us into humble servants for Jesus Christ. Someone shout amen. And this is so clearly taught as we looked at Romans 12, 1 and 2. Let's look at this very quickly again. You know the verse. How many know it? How many can quote it? You should be able to quote it. I beseech you therefore, brethren, right? By the mercies of God that you present your what? Bodies as what? A living sacrifice. That we offer our bodies, that we deny ourselves and say, okay, Lord, I am sacrificing my wants, my needs, my desires to do what you want. Amen. To present your bodies a living sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice? Holy, separated, separated unto God, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. After all, Jesus has done for us. Amen. What's the most reasonable thing I can do? What's the most reasonable thing you can do? Offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Amen. And do not be conformed to this world anymore. Don't live for this world. Come on. This world is heading towards destruction. How many get it? One day it's going to be renovated by fire. So there's nothing in this world you want. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get the word of God up here. Amen. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen. All things have passed away and all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God's. Amen. How many get it? The transformation process starts the moment you are saved and it does not end until you go home to be with the Lord because then you'll be made perfect as 1 John 3, 2 says. Amen. Now, to learn the truth of God's word so that the Holy Spirit can transform us so that we can become like Jesus is so important. And that is God's will as we talked about many times in this church. Romans 8, 29 and 30. For God predestined us. Amen. To be conformed to the image of his son. Amen. He's called us. He's called. He's, he, he is justified. He is justified. He is glorified. Amen. In this that we see what is happening right now in our lives is very important to understand. That 
you should be a little bit more like Jesus now than you were a year ago. Right. At least a little bit, right? <laughs> right? Believe me, brother and sister, I look back at my life, and I was a, I was a character. And there are things I'm ashamed of. There are things I wouldn't even want to share with you, the things I've done. I'm, some of you can say the same thing. You're not changed because you all of a sudden decided, I'm going to be a good person. You're changed because the Holy Spirit is working in you. Right, right. Amen? And it may be gradual, a little gradual. Little, some people change a little quicker than others. But the fact is, the seeds of God's Word are getting in, and you're beginning to see the fruit grow. Amen? Amen. And that's what I'm talking about. But you cannot, you cannot ever see these seeds grow if your heart is hardened and you're full of pride. Amen? You get it today? Because that's not God's will. We want to be renewed in our minds so we can prove what the perfect will of God is. You see, brother and sister, hear me today. Becoming like Christ is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. And this is what Jesus called us to do in Romans, or excuse me, in, in Matthew 28, 29, 30. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Go and make disciples, Jesus said. Go and make disciples. But is this the message that is being preached in most of the church? Come on. Is there an equipping process going on in most of the church today? I will say probably not. I like what Leonard Ravenhill said. How many know who Leonard Ravenhill is? One of the greatest teachers. He says the early church was married to poverty, prisons, and persecutions. Today, the church is married to prosperity, personality, and popularity. Someone say, oh my. Oh my. That's not an amen, is it? Do you know why... Today's pop, modern church, I should say, and popular, yeah, is all about pos prosperity, personality, and popularity. Do you know why? Because the church is full of a lot of self-serving Christians, not Christ-serving Christians. People who want to make it all about me, myself, and I. It's not enough that Christ died for them and suffered. They want Christ to do more. God, give me whatever I want in this life. It's a me-centered life, me-centered Christians instead of being Christ-centered. Two Sundays ago, we started dealing with this vital truth. To have the mindset of a humble servant, I said this, and this is so important. In fact, if, if you don't get this down, you're never going to get the rest. To have the mindset of a truly humble servant, number one, you must become a slave to Jesus Christ. You cannot make Jesus your slave. He cannot become your sugar daddy. He cannot become your cosmic bellboy. Someone that you can call on and say, I need more, Lord. I need prosperity. I need a better car. I need a better job. I need a better this or that. I want a bigger house. I want this. I want that. I got news for you. Jesus did not come and suffer on that cross so we can have a better life. Come on. He came and suffered and drank in God's wrath so that we could be saved from eternal hell. Come on. And the fact is, if Jesus never did another thing, not one thing for us other than what he did on the cross, he did everything. Come on. How can you add to that? Someone shout amen. amen. You see, brother and sister, there is no other option for the true believer that we become a slave to Jesus Christ. We have been set free from our sins to become a slave to Jesus. Someone shout amen. The true gospel is an invitation to a life of slavery to make Jesus Christ as Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, Lord. Now, this was the only point we looked at two Sundays ago. And it's so important. I want to revisit it for a few minutes. If you don't understand this, friend, you're not going to understand the rest. There is a false form of Christianity out there. How many know it? A false form of Christianity that's being promoted all the time. Think about what is being taught by popular TV preachers. In fact, look at their lifestyle. The millionaires, as we a brother was talking this morning, the, some of these guys are millionaires over and over and over again. But I want you to take a look at their life and compare it to the Apostle Paul. Is there any comparison? Not at all. Take a look at their life and compare it to Peter. 
Compare it to James. Compare it to John in, yes, Jesus. No comparison. So why is it so many are running after these lies and deceptions? Because it's all about feeding the flesh. You see, the flesh likes to be fed. How many I'm talking about? But my Bible says, and I know yours does too, that we are to crucify our flesh. In order to become a slave to Jesus, we must crucify our flesh. Amen. Look at Romans 1. 1, Paul says these words. Paul called as an apostle, a slave of Christ Jesus, set apart for the gospel of God. Do you know Paul said that several times? I'm not just an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm a slave. I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Why? Why would Paul say that? Because how many know that a slave has been purchased? Come on. Now, I said this two Sundays ago. I get it. There's a negative, negative incontication with, with people thinking, you know, slavery? After all, you know, all the, the, the horrors that uh, many people in America and other parts of the world went through, you're going to talk about slavery? I'm not talking about that kind of slavery. I'm talking about a bond slave. Come on. A bond slave who has been purchased has the choice to walk away. You see, on May the 13th, 1977, I got saved in a little Assembly of God church. Assembly of God church. And I could have easily just walked away and said, I'm saved. I'm saved and it doesn't matter. I'll go back and live my life. But I remember my pastor saying, now that you have understood what Christ has done on the cross for you, you have made him Savior. Now he must become Lord. What he did for you on the cross, he paid 100%. Now you're going to need to pay. Now we're not earning our salvation. We can't earn it. But if we are truly saved, we are going to give up. We are going to literally understand the price. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 6.20. For you have been bought with a what? A price. Therefore glorify God in your body. That's exactly what Romans 12.1 and 2 says, right? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Why? Because we become slaves to Christ. We are to have nothing to do with this world anymore, right? Amen? But rather we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to the Lord. Let's look at Philippians 2, 5 and 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, let this mind be in you. You know what that means? Let this attitude, let this, make sure you have this attitude which was also in Christ Jesus. Now Paul here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is literally telling us we are to get this mindset. It is to be developed in us over and over and over and over and over again. It's not something we just learn once in a while and then go on, but every day we must be reminded of what Christ did for us. He, he purchased us. We belong to him. Someone shout amen. Let this mind be developed in you. Make a decisive decision daily that you belong to Jesus and that you want your mind to be transformed. You don't want to live like you used to, but you want to have the renewing of your mind. Let a Christ-like attitude increase in your mind daily. And by doing so, you're going to humble yourself and understand what your purpose in this life is, is to serve Jesus Christ. Someone shout amen. Amen. Jesus doesn't serve you, you serve him. Amen. Look at verse 6. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal to God. Here we have God in the flesh comes down. The creator of all things. Colossians 1.15 Everything that was created was created by Jesus and for him. And yet he comes down and takes upon human flesh for the purpose of of doing one thing, and that is to go to the cross for you and I. If that doesn't do something for you, brother, you need to slap yourself right now and wake yourself up. That's why he came. He didn't have to, but he did. Because of his awesome love for you and I, he went willingly to a cross. Nobody took his life. He laid it down for you and I. Someone shout amen. Amen who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He did not consider it robbery that he would become a humble servant to suffer, bleed, and die and take God's wrath on the cross. Look at Philippians 2, verse 8. But made himself of no reputation, excuse me, verse 7, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Someone shout amen. Aren't you glad he did that? Now, why is this important? 
Because not only did Christ do that for us, he wants you and I to become like him. Here's a vital truth. To become a humble servant for Jesus Christ, you must daily deny yourself and your desires to follow him to do God's will. Did you know that? Daily. Turn to your neighbor and say daily. daily. You can't just do it on Sunday. It's got to be a daily thing. Remember what Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 23 through 25. And let's look at this. I'm just going to highlight it because I went through a lot of it two weeks ago. Then Jesus said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me. Anyone. See, once again, you've got to ask yourself a question. Why are you here this morning? Why do you want to believe in Jesus? Hmm? Think about it. Who is he to you? Jesus faced the same issue back then when people would run after him to get a miracle, to see a miracle, to get what they wanted. Remember I told you Jesus was the greatest show on earth. The thousands of, of miracles and healings and everything he did, people would say, Jesus is coming to town, let's go see what he's going to do today. And as soon as he got done teaching and ministering and performing these miracles, people would just get up and go home and say, wasn't that great? And I've never thought another thing about Jesus. So one day Jesus got a little ticked off. How many know our Lord and Savior got mad? He had a righteous anger. Amen? And that's why he said, he turned to them and said, if anyone desires to come after me, if you're going to come walking, following me around from town to town, let him deny himself and take up his cross. How often? Daily, Daily and follow me. Someone shout amen. amen. For whosoever desires to save his life will what? Lose, Lose it. Oh my. Oh my. Whoever desires to live for himself and do what pleases self is going to lose his life. And that's eternal life, brother and sister. But whoever loves his life for my sake will save it. Or excuse me, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In other words, who denies themselves takes up their cross daily. Look at verse 25. For what profit is a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost. Imagine if you gain the whole world, you are a billionaire over and over again. You have the nicest of homes, nicest of cars, you wear the best of jewelry and clothing, you fly wherever you want to go, and you end up in hell. It would have been better off to never be born. This is what Jesus is saying. He said it doesn't matter what you gain in this life. If, if you put anything before me, not only are you going to lose it, you're going to lose your life as well. How many get it with? Come on. How many churches today do you think are actually preaching and teaching the words of Jesus found here in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 23 through 25? Not very many. You know Why? Because it turns people off. There are a lot of pastors, they aren't going to touch it. You know why? Because they know people are going to get up and walk out. You see, this is what I've learned a long time ago. If you're not willing to follow Jesus, you're not part of the church anyway. Come on. Amen. You can get upset with me and say, I don't like that preacher's teaching. Well, don't get mad at me. I, I, this, is, this is God's word, not mine. Get mad at God if you want to get mad at him, but I, he's not going to change it to accommodate you or me or anybody else. Come on. You see, there are people today that are in church that say, yes, I want Jesus, but I want Jesus on my own terms. I'm not denying myself. I'm not denying my wants, my desires. I'm not denying, I got things that are important to me, like my sports teams. Football season's coming up. How is the Tampa Bay Bucks going to do this year? I'm not going to deny my career. I'm not going to deny all that. I'm going to have all these things. Then when, one day when I'm old and ready, then maybe I will decide it's time to follow Jesus. You better be doing it now because today may be your last day on earth. Are you hearing me today? You see, if you are trying to live for Jesus by living for this world at the same time, you don't know him. The true convert hates this world, hates the things of this world, right? Right? Now you say, wait a minute, Pastor, you're telling me that if, I, if I'm not living for Jesus, I'm not saved? That's exactly what I'm saying. Well, wait a minute, we're saved by grace. Yes, we are. But the person who is saved by grace is going to have a changed life. Amen. Right. Right. 
And if you don't believe me, read the Gospels. If you don't believe me, read Paul's epistles. Come on. In fact, let's look at one right now. Look at this. Romans 6, 15 and following. Everybody read this with me. What then shall we say? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Wait a minute. If I'm under grace, doesn't matter if I sin or not. You better believe it. The Word of God says what? Certainly not. Certainly not. Turn to your neighbor and say, certainly not. Absolutely not. God forbid. Do you not know whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are the one slaves whom you obey. Whether or of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. You are either a slave to your flesh or you're a slave to Jesus. Are you getting it? If you're a slave to your flesh, you're going to live to please yourself. But if you're a slave to Jesus Christ, you're going to obey God's word. Verse 17, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, how many know we were all slaves to sin at one time? Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you were delivered. What doctrine? Christ in him crucified. Someone shout amen. amen. It changed my life. Oh, I went to church when I was a kid, went to catechism, did the whole thing. But I was not changed. Not until I was introduced to the one who hung on that cross for me. And I couldn't understand how anyone could love me that much that he would not only just die for my sins, he took God's wrath upon himself. See, we often say, oh, he just died on the cross. No, he didn't. He became a sin offering. He drank in every ounce of God's wrath that you and I were supposed to, be, it was supposed to be poured out on us for all eternity. That you and I who are saved do not have to now have faced God's wrath in hell. Now we've been set free. Now, if, if you understand that, like I understood it 40 some years ago. Do you think I'm going to waste my life and live to please self after all he's done for me? No, sir. No, ma'am. And that's why this preacher is going to preach the uncompromised word of God every time I get behind this sacred desk. Come on. Even if it causes some people to get upset, I'm not trying to upset anybody intentionally. I want you to know the truth. Verse 18, And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of what? You know what that means? You become slaves of righteousness? That means you become a slave of Jesus. You're following in His footsteps. The Holy Spirit is doing the work in you. Verse 19, Paul says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. You see, before you and I were saved, that's how we lived. I was a lawless person. You were a lawless person. We lived to please self. All I wanted to do was look for the next party. That was me. And even after I come to know Christ, you remember the correcting process that's going on. I was convicted over and over and over again. Little by little, the Lord begins to change us. Amen. And guess what? I'm not arrived. Neither have you. If you live to be a thousand years old, you will never arrive. But you should be moving in the right direction. Amen? How many say I'm moving in the right direction? Look at the next part of this verse. So now present your members, that's the members of your body, as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Remember what Romans 12, 1 and 2 says. Present your bodies as a what? living sacrifice. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, when we were living in sin, we didn't have no righteousness of Christ in us. The Holy Spirit wasn't working in us. But look at verse 21. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? Not, the answer is none. I'm ashamed of my life the way I lived. I had no fruit of the Holy Spirit. I couldn't because I wasn't saved. But now... I am saved, I see God working in me. How about you? How about you? Amen. Look at this. For the end of these things is death. If we do not have righteousness in us, the end of these things is death. Because Galatians chapter 5, and get this, Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21 says, this is the work of the flesh. This is the work of the flesh. Paul gives a list. Sexual immorality, drunkenness, homosexuality, all these things that people live to please their, themselves. Adultery, fornication, being a thief, hatred, dissensions, all these things that Paul talks about. 
He, it, and these were how we lived. And these are the works of the flesh that lead to death. But thanks be to God. How many get it today? But that was then. This is now. Amen. Come on. That was then. This is now. Amen. You say, Pastor Dave, you're telling me you, you don't sin? Listen, we can all sin. We just don't want to. The true believer doesn't want to sin. Amen? Amen. We don't want to sin. We can fall into sin. We're not going to roll in it. Come on. There's a difference. There's a big difference. Amen. We, we don't want to. You have the fruit to what? Holiness. Do you see that? And the end everlasting life. Listen, brother and sister, please. Without holiness, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, without holiness, no man shall see God. Do you get that? Holiness simply means that we've been separated from this world unto God so the Holy Spirit can work in us and the righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit is being produced. Amen. Amen. Do you get that? This is what produces the righteous acts that we talked about earlier, the righteous acts of the saints, the Holy Spirit. So understood rightly, the gospel is an invitation or a call to slavery. It is a constant denying of self to follow and obey Jesus. Does everybody understand that? No message can be rightly called the gospel if it denies these truths. Amen. The gospel calls sinners such as you and I to give up our independence to live for ourselves by denying ourselves and to follow Jesus. Someone shout amen. amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Here's the vital truth and we're going to pick it up from here very quickly. By confessing Jesus as your Lord. By the way, the Greek word for Lord is kyrios. You're declaring him as master. When's the last time you called Jesus Lord? I bet you did it today. Did you call him Lord? Did you say Lord Jesus? Then you're calling him your master. You're saying he's the one that's in charge. I'm the one following him. Amen. You're telling him that every day he is Lord. He is the master of your life and that you're going to obey his word. Amen. You're confessing to Jesus that you have become his slave. Someone say amen. amen. To do this, you must humble yourself and place yourself under God daily. Don't be deceived. We looked at this a few weeks ago. I want you to see this. Don't, do not be deceived. Everyone wants Jesus to be their Savior, but only a few allow him to be their Lord. And that's why Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, why do you say, Lord, Lord? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Do you get that today? How many say, I'm going to do what he says? I love him. Amen. Amen. To develop the mindset of a truly humble servant, number two. Now, these are going to be very quick. I got through the most important part. How many understand you must become a slave? A bond servant. Amen. Number two, you must never seek to be recognized by men, but everything you say and do is to always point to Jesus and to bring glory to him only. Amen. Please understand this, brother and sister. Yes, Jesus is my... Lord, I am his slave. So that means that he is everything. We are nothing. Come on. Can I have a good amen? amen? We must never, ever do anything. I don't care how gifted and talented you may be. You must never do anything that brings honor to self. It is to always bring honor to Jesus. Amen. Only Jesus. Someone shout amen. Are you getting it? Look at this, Philippians 2, 7. But Jesus made himself of no what? No reputation. Yet he has all the reputation. He's God. I don't know if you know this, but you can't go a lot higher than that. Come on. He is God in the flesh. But yet when he came down, he didn't go around beating his drum and say, look at me, watch me. All he did was humbly serve everyone he came in contact with. Amen. He made himself of no reputation, taking upon the form of a bondservant. Amen. Now look at Matthew 20, 28. What did Jesus come to do? Come to be recognized? Come to be, look at me? No, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Man, does that do something for you? It does something for me. Yeah, absolutely, brother. He didn't come to say, look at me, serve me, make me everything. Of course he is everything. But when he came before he rose again, he came to serve. 
He didn't come to be served, he came to serve, and that's exactly what it did, amen. Look at Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through what kind of ambition? Selfish ambition or conceit. Why? Because Christ had no selfish ambition. He didn't have no conceit. But in lowliness of mind, because Christ had lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Brother and sister, if we would do this at Abundant Life Fellowship, we would be an absolutely amazing church. Oh, I could start preaching now. But let me tell you something. I've been in the ministry going on 40 years. And I will tell you that 90% of the problems caused in churches is because of selfishness. People who really think they're something. People who think it's all about me. I want to be recognized. If I do something in church, I want to be recognized. I want the credit. I want things my way. If I'm going to come to church, pastor, you better preach the kind of messages I like. You better sing the kind of music and worship songs that I like. You better do things my way. You better get church done at a certain time or I'm going to somewhere else. Well, then go somewhere else. Goodbye. Because I got news for you. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. Amen. And the sooner we learn that lesson, we're going to get along a lot better. Amen. Amen. And I can tell you every problem caused. And I've got some people in this church that know they've been around with me. They've been here long enough to know that every problem caused in church is caused by some selfish person who doesn't care about no one else but themselves. Yes. How many get what I'm talking about? And I could give you one testimony after another, but I'm not going to because I'm not going to glorify these very selfish people. But I will tell you every wonderful thing that's happened in church in the 40 years that I've been pastoring, the most wonderful things have been because of Christians who love Jesus more than they love their own life Amen. and serve their brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Are you getting that today? Let each esteem others better than himself. That means you and I are to treat our brothers and sisters better than we would ever treat ourselves. You know what? That means we've got to become humble servants. Someone shout amen. amen. Look at verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests. The Lord didn't say we can't look out for our own interests. He just says don't be looking out for your interests only. Amen. But also for the what? Interest of others. In other words, have a loving relationship with your brothers and sisters that you care enough about them that you will do whatever you can to help them. Amen. Amen. See, you're not just coming to church here to sit and listen and be taught. We're going somewhere with this. If you're going to be part of Abundant Life Fellowship, then we have got to be servants together. In fact, we should have a contest. Let's see who can outserve someone else. Come on. <laughs> see who can actually become that humble servant. I'm not... I'm not I'm just kidding on that. I would never make it into a contest. But just imagine if we had that attitude. I'm coming here today because I want to serve. What can I do to help the church today? What can I do? You know, maybe you're, you're, just, you're a baby Christian. You say, I can't do much in teaching, but I can sure help by cleaning the church. I can help Ed out. Or maybe I can work outside in the yard. We've got a lot of land out there we've got to take care of. Or maybe I can help Usher. I can hand out bulletins. Right? Think about all the things you can do. Or I can help my brother and sister any way I can. I can go to my brother and sister and say, what can I do to help? Can I help with the kids? Can I help with this ministry? Come on. Can I help with the Spanish service? Anything I can do. Someone shout amen. amen. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, this should be our motto. This should be our foundation. Do all things to the glory of God. All things, whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you drink, whatsoever you things you do, do all for the glory of God. In other words, make it about Jesus. Amen. Look at this passage of scripture in Luke 22, 24 through 25. How many know disciples were some characters? How many know they got rubbed Jesus wrong a few times? <laughs> you know, just your old Peter. And like I said, if we, if we did a comparison of what kind of disciples we would match up with, I would probably be a Peter more than I would be a John. John was a more loving, patient person. Peter was, get her done, you know. I'm going to get it done. Get out of my way, you know, because I'm coming through, you know. And oftentimes by doing that, he run over people. Well, I know uh, that I've done that a few times. 
You have to learn, you know, and, and Jesus had to knock old Peter down a few notches, didn't he? You know, if anybody got confronted, it was old Peter. Peter got confronted a few times. Now, there was also a dispute among them, the disciples, as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Mm -hmm. Things haven't changed much in the last 2,000 years. And he, Jesus, said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. Now look at verse 26. But Jesus said, but not so among you. As believers in Christ, Jesus is saying to us, yes, there's a world out there that wants to exercise authority over everybody. They want to be big shots. But in the church, there is no big shots. There's only one, that's Jesus. He's in the center. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. The rest of us are servants. Amen. On the contrary, Jesus said, He who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. In other words, you know who the younger always was? He was the guy that got stuck with the, 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 the meaningless jobs. The little brother, you know, or the guy that was just starting out, he was at the bottom of the totem pole. And this is what Jesus is saying. If you want to be greatest, then make yourself the lowest. Someone shout amen. And he who governor, governs as he who serves. In other words, if you want to be a leader, you got to be a servant. Do you get it? I remember, let me just share this with you. I, I got out of Bible college in 1988, graduated with a, a, a BA in, in Bible theology and come back to help do my internship at, at the little Assembly of God church I got saved in and I was there all ready to go. You know, pastor, I'm here. You know, even my pastor did not have a Bible college education. He had two years of, of um, Brian courses and um, I thought, you know, I, I know a few things. And the pastor said, okay, here's how we're going to do this for your, you had to do a year internship. You get to preach one Sunday night, a month, one Sunday night, that's it. And you're going to help out with the kids, the Royal Rangers. Anybody heard of Royal Rangers? <laughs> you know, there they are. And also, you're going to help clean the church. And I'll never forget, he says, now listen, David, I want you to understand this. He says, before I can allow you to stand behind the sacred desk, you've got to kneel in front of the sacred thrones. <laughs> and clean those toilets. And I cleaned a lot of toilets. Oh, Bible college education, learn real quick. And you know, when Teresa and I, our first couple of churches, we had to do that. You know, we didn't have janitors, so we learned to clean. You have to do those things, amen. You do it because you love Jesus. There is no such thing as a meaningless servant when you do it for Jesus, amen. Verse 27, for who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Well, Jesus said, you know what? It is not he who sits at the table. It is not he who sits at the table. Yeah, he's the greater, yet I am among you the one who serves. Jesus said, look at me. I'm king of kings and lord of lords. I'm Messiah, and yet, what's he do? Next slide. He washed their feet. He served them. Matthew 23, 11, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Are we learning anything? Yes. Number three, to develop the mindset of a truly humble servant, you must realize that any gift or ability that you may have comes only from God. Amen. Have you ever been around some of these people who think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread? I'm talking about some of these musicians and singers and I mean, I, I have been acquainted with some of these Christian artists. They are talented. They are talented. And some of them can sing like angels. I know some preachers that can preach a message at the drop of a hat. I mean, they very polished. But I'm here to tell you something. There's still a lump of clay that God has instilled his gifts and talents in. Come on. And I've learned that. Brother and sister, hear me. I know some of you say, Pastor Dave, thank you for preaching and teaching and all that. You know, give God all the glory. Anything that I can I, do is because of him. Amen? Amen? Only because of him. I'm just a lump of clay. So are you. That God wants to use for his glory. Amen? And we must always understand that. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at this now. As each one has received a gift. How many know, know that you have a gift? 
Look at me up here now. This is some, another whole sermon, but you have, a, you have a gift that the church can use. Come on. And those gifts are going to be perfected over time. Minister it to who? One another as what? Good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In other words, because of God's grace, you and I have these gifts. Come on. God's unmerited favor, not because of who we are. I have been around some of these people that really are gifted, and you know what? They really believe it's because of them God is able to do anything. God is so lucky to have me. I've been around some of these preachers who really do believe they are something. And they walk around with bodyguards around them and look at me thinking they are something. I got news for you. They may think they're something in their eyes, but in the eyes of God, they are nothing. And you know what, brother and sister? The moment you and I learn this, because if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, get this. Anytime we speak, it better come from God's word, because guess what? It comes from God. The gift comes from God. The word comes from God. Amen. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability, which who supplies? God supplies. Everything we have, God has given it to us to be used for his glory. Amen. In other words, we don't come up with anything. Even the message that I'm preaching to you now, believe me, God gave it. It's from His Word. I didn't write it. Come on. The Bible study Ken taught this morning. I got news for you. He didn't write it. God gets all the glory. Someone shout amen. amen. That in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. All things to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You and I deserve no credit, not one ounce, not even a little bit. He gets it all. Why? James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from where? Above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. James 1.17. Finally, number four, and we'll close. To develop the mindset of a truly hum humble servant, I get this, you must decrease daily so Christ can increase in you. Hear me, brother and sister. This is so important. Please understand this. You must decrease daily. That's what Jesus meant in Luke 9, 23. If any man, any woman comes after me, let him deny himself. Decrease. Let him take up his cross or her cross. Decrease. And follow Jesus. Jesus increases. In other words, you and I have got to get ourselves out of the way. To become more and more like Jesus, you and I have to get ourselves out of the way. Because, let me just say this, on your best day, you and I are not even close to becoming like Jesus. On my very best day, I think I'm something, I am the exact opposite of who he is. Are you getting it? If we don't get ourselves out of the way, we're going to make a mess of things. Someone shout amen. Amen. You and I will never be complete and we will never be equipped for God's glory as long as we try to do things our way instead of God's. There was a certain man who was a great prophet. You might remember his name, John. You remember what he said when he was uh, uh, confronted by the Pharisees? Look at, look at, look at, your, your, your disciples are leaving you and going and following Jesus. Doesn't that tick you off, John? Aren't you upset that your disciples that you have trained so hard and so long are leaving you and going to follow Jesus? And what does John say? Look at his words. He must increase. I must decrease. There has to be a decreasing in our life if Christ is going to increase. Are you getting it? There is no room for Jesus and self. It's either all of Jesus or all of self. Are you getting it? Come on. There is no room for me, myself, and I, and then Jesus. It's either he is on the throne or we are on the throne. Which one's on your throne today? Come on. In conclusion, let's look at 1 Peter 5, 5, and James, and we're, we're going to pray. Likewise, you younger people... Look at me, all you younger people in here. You, you who are young like me, look at me. 
I wished. But this is something important. You younger people, you young Christians, learn something. Learn that there are men and women who, who know a little bit more than you do. Come on. And not in a proud way. But I know how these young people are today. Of course, I sound like my dad when I say that. But uh, the young people today really think they know everything. And we've had them in our own church. You know, I've had them here, and I, I try to warn them. Listen to me. You're heading in the wrong direction. You're heading in the wrong direction. No, I'm not. I'm going to do what I want. And pretty soon, they're out of the church. They're living in sin. You know why? Because there is no submission to godly authority in the church anymore. There is no submission to men and women of God, your older brothers and sisters, who have been around the block a few times. Come on. Are you getting it? I know, I'm a dad, I've got grandkids, you know. I told my, my uh, uh, son, I said, wait till your kids are teenagers. You know, what goes around comes around. I said, wait till you're a teenager, you're gonna find out. Yeah, well, one turned teenager, you know, I said, now she's the smartest person in the world, and all of a sudden you become the dumbest person in the world. Submit yourselves to your elders. Kids, submit, learn to submit to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. In other words, be willing to learn from one another. Be willing to talk. And don't think you know it all. And be clothed with what? Clothed with what? Humility. Why? Because God resists the what? Proud. God always resists the proud. You know why? Because God's not going to share his glory with anyone. But God gives grace to the humble. Amen. In fact, you know what? You can't even be saved unless you humble yourself and repent of your sins. Listen to me. The first humiliating thing that happened in my life and will happen in yours if you're saved is you have to admit that you are a sinner and you can't save yourself, not in a zillion years. And that you are lost and you are hell bound without any hope. Therefore, you humble yourself, repent. Jesus, I sinned against you. And I'm lost and I need you. I need you 100% because I can't get there without you. Amen? Amen? And that's why when we repent, there's a brokenness that takes place in us. We grieve that we have violated a thrice holy God, his word, and we ask him to forgive us. Look at verse 6. Therefore, read this with me, humble yourselves under who? The mighty hand of God. In other words, Jesus is Lord. Humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Jesus is Lord. We are his slave that he may exalt you in due time. In other words, there is an exaltation process that takes place in every believer when God knows we have learned our lesson. God will lift us up, not for our glory, but for His. Amen. Amen. God knows when we have learned our lesson and we have finally come to a point where we realize without Him we are nothing. Casting all your care upon Him for He cares for you. How many know that? And let's finish with James 4, 8-10. Then we're going to pray. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Notice it doesn't say, God, come here. I'll draw near to you if you draw near to me. No, you draw near to him first. Do you notice that? You draw near to God first. And he will draw near to you. When will God draw near to us? When we are willing to repent, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What's this verse talking about? It's talking about that when we realize that we are hopeless without him every day, Heavenly Father, I come to you and I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to help me. I ask you to please work in my life because I can't do it. Look at verse 9. Lament, mourn, and weep. Why? Because we're all sinners. Amen? And that song that we sang, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 
excuse me, 1 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. What's it say? If my people who are called by my name shall what? Humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Then I shall what? Hear their cries and I shall heal their land. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will what? Lift you up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Brother and sister, hear me. If we are going to be the kind of church that's going to accomplish God's will, Jesus has to be king. He has to be Lord. We have to be slaves. Amen? Amen. He has to be first. We have to be last. See, you and I must be last. Never third and fourth or fifth. Jesus first, our family second, our brothers and sisters in Christ third, we must be last. Amen? Do you get it? Praise God. And if we get it right like that, God then will eventually lift us up. Here's a final vital truth, then we'll pray. Get this. God will only exalt the man or woman who humbles themselves to do his will. And that will is both proclaiming the gospel to the lost and serving the body of Christ for the purpose of promoting love and unity in the church. Amen? Amen. Promoting love and unity in the church. Can I have an amen? Amen. amen? Preaching that gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is a gospel of love. Christ and Him crucified. And also loving one another, doing for one another. And we serve the Lord because we love Him, not because we expect to get anything in return. How, how many of you today say, I love Jesus? How many love him no matter what? If he never did another thing for you, you're going to love him. You'll serve him no matter if he doesn't do anything else. See, that's the kind of heart you need to have. You make that commitment to the Lord. You've already done everything for me, Lord. You've already done everything for me by going to that cross. I can't expect anything else. I expect me to do everything for you now. Amen. Remember, it's your reasonable act of service. Amen. Amen. Go to the next one. Verse John 2, 6, the one who says he remains in him should what? Walk just as he walked. How did Jesus walk? He walked as a humble servant. He cared for people. He loved people. You and I must have that same attitude. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. See, brother and sister, if we don't, if we do not have that humble mindset, we're never going to accomplish God's will and be equipped for his glory. See, a humble person doesn't care what people think about them. You see, some of you, you you're, you're, you're putting off witnessing to your family and friends. You say, I know I should tell them about Jesus, but oh, I just don't know what they're going to think of me if I do. That's pride. You're more concerned about them being angry with you and upset with you if you tell them the truth. You've got to learn to be a humble servant. Are you getting it? Same with serving in church. The reason why some of you don't want to serve is because, well, I don't know if I might mess up and do things wrong. That's pride. I'd rather try and fail than not try at all because you're going to fail if you don't try. Come on. Amen. You get it? I'd rather be a diamond with a flaw than a perfect brick. Amen. Amen. All right? <laughs> Think about that for a moment. Amen. In a few moments, we're going to pray for the needs. If you have any needs, you can please come. But we're going to sing this song. It's an old uh, uh, chorus from years ago. But how many of you today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, never ask Brother Ken to come to the piano, please? I can't let this moment go by without first making sure everyone here today you are truly saved. You see, everything I talked about today can never be accomplished in your life unless you have come to Jesus and made him your Savior and Lord. 
Only the Holy Spirit can do the transformation process in us, not anything we can do. Without being saved, you do not have the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, nothing's going to happen. You're never going to be changed. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to make sure that if you have never received Christ as your Savior, I'm talking about you've never repented of your sins because you are a sinner. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And my friend, if you are in your sins, you are going to spend eternity in a place called hell. Be warned, this may be your last day on earth. Hell is filling up every day. For the wages of sin, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. The good news, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What Jesus is saying to you today, he's saying, come. Repent of your sins. Believe on me, what I did on the cross for you. Make me your Savior and Lord. If there's anyone here today you haven't done that, I ask that you please do that right now, just for a moment. Heavenly Father, if there anyone here or anyone watching, they have not received you as Savior and Lord, please, Lord, help them to do so. That they may know you and they may become your humble servants, your disciples for your glory. In Jesus' name. Now who today say, I am saved. I am saved. Raise up your hands. I am saved. I am saved. Say it. I am saved. If you're saved, then you ought to become a humble servant. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit working in you who is calling you to deny yourself and take up your cross daily. Are you doing so? Are you doing so? We're going to sing this chorus, and I want you to sing it with me. And make this your prayer before we pray for anyone who has needs. Hallelujah. Would you stand and sing it with me? Some of you may know this, some of you may not, but how many of you know that it should be our heart to serve Jesus? Amen. Sing it with me. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken pieces, Ruin lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch was what I longed for. You have given life to me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. How many say, Lord, I will serve thee. Hallelujah, I will serve thee. I will follow you every day, Jesus. I will give you my life every day, Lord. I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to deny my desires. I'm going to deny the things of the world. I'm going to give my life to you every day. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, help us to become those servants for your glory. Help us to see the needs of our brothers and sisters who are struggling. Help us to care about the loss that we would witness to them and share the truth of the gospel. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As Brother Ken, as you, as you play, I'm going to ask Brother Ken to come and, and dismiss us. Those of you who need prayer, please stay afterwards. We'll pray with you. Thank you for enduring the heat today in this place. It will be fixed Wednesday. All right? I'm sorry about this, but we made it through it. Amen? Amen. How many love Jesus now? Give the Lord a praise offering. Praise God. Praise God. 
I'm just, I can just sit here all day long and bask in that. You can never get enough of the true gospel. Amen? Praise God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for the word, the word of the Lord that we've heard today, Lord God. We've had a wonderful day. Father, we give you all the praise and the glory. Just one touch. That's all we need, Lord. Just one touch from you, Lord. And we'll never be the same again. Lord, we want that one touch, Lord God. We want to be humble servants, Lord. That's the, really the desire of our heart, be a humble servant, Father God, and to serve you, and but also to serve the body of Christ, Lord God. And Lord, I ask you, Father God, to help us to be that way as we look to the cross and look what Jesus there did for us, that he, how he humbled himself. Father, we need to humble ourselves up under the blood-stained banner of the cross, Lord God, and look to that always. And as long as we continue to look to what he's done, accomplished for us, Lord, we have no room to brag or exalt ourselves. Well, we exalt Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we thank you for today, Lord. I ask you to bring, take everyone home safely this afternoon. Bring them back safely tonight and Wednesday night, Lord, as we continue our study at the end times and the times we're living in, how we can be aware of these false prophets and teachers, Lord and expose them for who they are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen.